Kuzuzampo and a very good evening to all our viewers. This is PBS Channel 2 and I am Karma Dendup, your host for the next one hour. This is Chanchup Shing, your weekly dose of Buddhism. For those of you who are watching us for the first time, what we do on this show is we discuss uh, Buddhist truths with Buddhist masters, teachers and practitioners in an effort to better comprehend the vast and timeless Buddha Dharma. Uh, without wasting any more time, our topic on this very special episode is Nguyen Ro, also known as the Preliminary Practice. And our very special guest on this very special episode is His Eminence, Sugil Rinpoche. Sogyal Rinpoche was born in Kham in eastern Tibet. Rinpoche was recognized at an early age as the incarnation of a great master and visionary saint of the 19th century, Lerab Lingpa Terten Sugil. who in turn was the incarnation of Nanam Doji Dujum, a disciple of Guru Padma Sambhava. Tirten Sogil was a prolific Tirten, a revealer of spiritual treasures whose collected revelations fill 20 volumes and whose many disciples include the 13th Dalai Lama Thupten Jatso, the 3rd Dodrupchen Rinpoche Jigmi Tempi Nima, and Jamyang Kense Chuki Lodro. It was Jamyang Kense Chuki Lodro Rinpoche who recognized Sogil Rinpoche as the incarnation of Tirten Sogil. Sogil Rinpoche received the traditional training of a Tibetan Lama under the close supervision of Jamyang Khense Chuki Lodro, one of the most outstanding spiritual masters of the 20th century who raised Rinpoche like his own son. Rinpoche over the years went on to study with many great masters of all schools of Tibetan Buddhism, especially Chabje Dujum Rinpoche, Chabje Dilgo Khense Rinpoche and Nishiken Rinpoche. In 1971, Rinpoche went to England, where he also studied comparative religion at Cambridge University. Sogil Rinpoche is also the author of the highly acclaimed The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, a book which has over 2 million copies in print in 56 countries and in 31 languages. Rinpoche is also the founder and spiritual director of Rigpa, an international network of over 130 Buddhist centers and groups in 40 countries around the world. Welcome to our show. On this auspicious occasion, Kuzu Zambo, everybody, and I'm very happy to be here in, in Bhutan. And I love the country and the people. Actually, the Bhutanese people are they're very spiritual. They're also people are very vital, and you know, and the youth also has that you know, vitality. And particularly if they really begin to understand the Chu Dharma, and it will bring so much life, heart, soul. So I'm happy to share and. Uh, since you're the one who began interview me, Chan Chup Singh, I'm going to name you Chan Chup. <laughs> Thank you, Rimuche. Uh, Rimuche, um, while this is not the first time I've got this opportunity, this Rimuche has been gracious enough to uh, accept my request the first time, and this is the second time around. Rimuche, any opening remarks or anything that Rimuche would like to, to get the ball rolling la, about using media to uh, share the Dharma with people? I think, the, in some ways, it's, it's a kind of a modern miracle. There are all these uh, facilities. I remember, you know, Ningu Ken Zimche. And we looked and looked, searched for a, a recording of a teaching by Jaman Ken Chuchlodu. Was it done in the, in the late 50s? for All India Radio, incredible teaching gift. We looked and looked, we couldn't find it because no wise recording of it. And similarly, there was a film that when the Nehru came to, 
there was a film and we looked because if only we had a recording of these masters, I mean, it'd be so wonderful. I mean, now there's a whole new lineage of teachings by Kenzer Mbache, Kebju Dunyur Mbache, which are actually recorded, and some of the great masters, like I have also the Karmapa, and some of the great masters, really, and it's so valuable, so amazing. So it's like such a wonderful way to bring alive the presence. And also said that, you know, Buddhas actually benefit beings through their being, through the body manifestation, ku, and through the speech, su, and took with his mind, all pervading, and with his wisdom and compassion. But one that through which he benefit most through su. And so very much, I think it's, it's a wonderful vehicle, but also, it also can be misused. And particularly in this modern age, there's overuse of internet. And all kinds of, you see, um, it's a kind of another pollution. So we've got to watch out, particularly all kinds of gossips and these things, you know. We should be discerning, never be carried by whatever is on the media. You know, not to be carried away, to discern, you know, the truth from the facts. Very important to do that, very important. Rimuche, uh, since uh, the first time I interviewed Rimuche, Rimuche's blessing has helped our show grow from a monthly to a weekly show. And uh, people are really benefiting, is what we hear from uh, their feedback. I, I'm so happy. Yes. One, uh, the topic of the uh, show today la, being preliminary practice, Gyanrola. This was requested by our uh, followers online. So, to begin uh, speaking about Nyanro, what does Nyanro mean, like, if Rinpoche could uh, enlighten us? Nyan means before, Nyanro is to go. So, it means like the preliminary, preliminary practice, but it's also the foundation. Particularly in the Kagyu tradition, it's called the four foundations. It's like a foundation, it's like the entrance, the preliminary, but at the same time, you see many masters, such as the Kunchen Longchen Ramjam, Omnis Longchen Ramjam, and followed by, for example, Patrum great masters, Kenzo Rinpoche used to say, Dujum Rinpoche very much a kind of advocate of that thing, that many uh, teachings emphasize the main practice, but we here emphasize the Ngundu. Because Ngundu, if you really realize the Ngundu, it's extraordinary. It's not just a preliminary, in fact, it's the main. It got every essence of that. Yes. Rimuche, this Nyandro practice is um, a Vajrayana practice, a Mahayana, a Theravada. Could Rimuche no, shed some light? Nyandro is actually the beginning part of it. You see, it's all the three vehicles are there. Yes. It's Tekpasum Gulam. It's included with that. I mean, for example, we begin with what? I mean, in, the, in our tradition, we begin by saying, first, calling the Lama, or invoking the Lama, Lama Jambu. There's a wonderful one from Longshini Dimundu. I remember Kensu Rinpoche used to love it. Now I first do the translation of that, and then I chant. O oh, Lama, care for me, like think of me, and look after me, kind of thing. From the blossoming lotus of devotion, in the center of my heart, rise up, O oh, compassion, Lama, my only refuge. I am plagued by past actions and turbulent emotions to protect me my, in my misfortune. Remain in the dual honor on the crown of my head, the chakra of great bliss, rousing all my mindfulness and awareness, I pray. You see, from the blossoming lotus of devotion, you know, that was just so beautiful, you know the center of my heart. You know, the Lama, actually, at night, Lama rests in your heart. And from him radiating rays of light and transforming the sleep, which is ignorance, into luminosity, and doing the practice of Osar, Malam Osar Jiva. And in the day, when you say Lama, rise up, like good morning, you know, rise up, always ascend through the central channel, that's his private lift, come on the crown of his, you see, and lotus, and then like the airport tower, where he sees everything, look after me with my, all my thoughts, emotions, as is in the Lojong teachings. In the very most famous one of Lojong is the 
uh, eight words of training with the mind. In that, the third was, in all my actions, may I examine my mind. Whenever I see a negative thought, emotion rises, since it endanger myself and others, um, then I shall firmly avert and face. So therefore, Lama becomes your mindful awareness and look after you, protect you from your negative, destructive emotions, your habitual patterns. And it's so beautiful. If I may chant that very inspiringly, how country children children used to chant, and think we can to love that. La 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 so we need throughout the day mindfulness, awareness, and conscientiousness, you know, and Lama becomes your mindfulness during the day, guide you. That's the beginning. Beginning with invocation. That's the beginning, no rising. See, it's like saying good morning <laughs> and you know, my sunshine. <laughs> my sunshine is Lama. <laughs> I remember when I was young, there were some beautiful songs of Leonarati, romantic ones. I used to relate to Guru Mithi. Plus, <laughs> plus. <laughs> Skillful means. <laughs> Rimoji, thank you so much for blessing us with that uh, soulful prayer. This is a very blessed chant. Yes, yes. Rimoji, uh, speaking about the Lama and uh, all of Buddhist practice, especially the Mahayana and then in particular the Vajrayana, the guru-disciple uh, relation is sacred and it is the ultimate path to enlightenment. And within the Nyundro, I believe the final culmination is the Guru Yoga. Let me enjoy it. That's right. Very much. Yes. But uh, the Nyundro practice, like many of us, uh, people who are practicing Nyundro also, they go straight away into the Chabdrola. They start with the prostrations and all of that. I heard uh, Rimuchi speak so eloquently and so simply about the Lodonam Jila. Yeah, that's important. Yes. If Rimuchi could uh, share something on the Lodonam Jila. Lodonam Jila. I remember, you see, Kensan Bache, Kensan Bache, guiding. Uh, there were a group of, one of the first groups of practitioners who did three retreat in France. Yes. And the guidance of Kebbi Dujan and Kansan both. And they requested for him instruction of Dzogchen. Yes. He wrote a hard verse, you know, Shaldam. Yes. And you know, the whole, the three, I think two thirds were all about Lodo Namshi. Yes. <laughs> and just a little, and then this on, on the main practice. The Lodo Namshi is, Lodo, you see, I remember the room you say, Lodo Namji is like the plow in the field, you know, so that you see, and to really, therefore, so maybe sow the seed of enlightenment in a sense, awaken the seed of enlightenment. And very much actually, you know, Buddhism is about transforming the mind. As Buddha said in, in the most famous teaching, essence of teaching, Digpa Chiyom Mijaki, Gyawa Pusun Sopwa Chit, Ranga Semli Yom Snitsangyit, Digpa Chiyom Mijaki, commit not a single ounce of action. Or rather, what really means is, as much as possible, you know, um, abandon all the negative thoughts, emotions, which are the cause of suffering for yourself and others. Give up and so forth, as much as possible, cultivate all the positive, wholesome, and beneficial acts which are the cause of happiness for yourself and others. Basically, the masters will say, Lama will say, you know, if you cannot help, at least don't harm. Don't keep malice and hatred in your heart. Keep your heart and mind pure. Very much. Because you see, you realize that, you know, Chamdu Damba, Chamdu Damba, refuge. Chamdu Damba, the ones you take in refuge, the most important precept of the refuge for is that of Dharma. The Dharma is the basis of, you see, Dharma. And there, the main precept is not harming, refraining by Yena, never match. That's what Master said, if you cannot have, it don't harm. That's the basis of the basic vehicle. Uh, better to say, not say Hinayana, because it's not so politically correct. Yes, sir. Theravada, I believe. Theravada, Theravada no. 
Theravada is uh, an offshoot of Hinayana. There are many branches of Theravada. There's only one part. It's basic to say basic yana oh. or the root yana. Yeah. Because what Buddha taught at the first Four Noble Truths became the basis of the entire teaching of Buddha. There's a great master called Kimbongak Chung, great Dzogchen master. When he began, like Polo Kimbo was the disciple of his. And uh, when he taught, he began with Four Noble Truths as the basis. And then the entire framing, the entire teaching. So anyway, so therefore the third line is most important, which is Ranga Semni also. Though. You know, main thing is I want to say, I didn't finish saying it. You know, if you, because when you really look deeply, if you, even if for yourself, really, you know, for your own good into self-interest, if you think of, if you harm others, it harms you. If you help others, it helps you. In fact, it's realized that when you help others, work for the benefit of others, your own happiness is taken care of as a matter of course. Chances are, so very much, you know, uh, you know, very much benefiting others and keeping your heart and mind pure. Very much, that's very important. And the most important third line of teaching Buddha, Ranga Samyos, to tame this mind of ours, to conquer, to tame this mind. Because if you transform your mind, then your perception of your experience will be transformed. Thereby, Lord Oknam, she transforms the mind, you know, yeah. the rough part of our being to overcome and really jundur uh, is, you know, to subjugate ourselves, to conquer our mind heart. That's what Lord Oknam, she Lord Oknam, she, first of all, if I jump straight into it, if you like. Plus, plus. First is, you see, is the Tanjurnyaka, precious human birth. I mean, I, my teachings are based on all the teachings of the great masters, you know. For example, two main are uh, very, the Kunzala Mishanu, which comes from Longchenpa, Jingme Lingba Patrumbache, and it's really Rime. I mean, Kunzala Mishanu, word map, I think it's just wonderful. It has the some of the great quotes of the great uh, Kagyu masters, Dupa Kagyu masters, life story of them, interspersed with so many anecdotes, beautiful ones. And then top in the end, put a uh, 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 gumbo pass, you know, dual ornament of liberation. These are the two main things. Anyway, so the first is Tanjur, I will, but I will try to teach more in a, a little bit like a modern or more direct way, is that, you know, we human beings, you know, we are. The wonderful thing about us, you know, I mean, even though we might not think we have the best life, you know, we, we you know. No, it is said that actually, if you're born in the realm of God, they have the very high standard of life, luxury, but they're immersed, there's almost like a sleep, they're not aware. If you're born in the hell, you're too much suffering, you won't be able to practice them. See, human beings, we have both, we have enough suffering, but well, we also got some happiness. So it's a really the best basis of practice Dharma is the human life. And even though we might not have the best life, best condition, but the fact that we have the mind, heart, and intelligence that can understand, we can understand each other and communicate. We can understand the truth and communicate. That's why communication is very important. Understanding is very important. Human understanding. Understanding. That's why our Papa Chenesi, one great master, a uh, uh, Vietnamese master, Thich Nhat Hanh, used to say, the hand of the Our Lukashu is actually understanding. The understanding is very important, understanding. So anyway, so we have the uh, potential to really understand, uh, realize, to, as I said in the teachings, you know, Simchen and the Sangye, they went to a little from Jutani, from the Heva Jutani. Simchen being the Buddhas, but yet they are obscured by adventitious stains. One these obscures removed, they are Buddha indeed. What is, uh, what is adventitious stains? Saint Lubr, 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 meaning. Actually, one very important thing is Buddha nature. It's very important. Basis of Buddha nature. I mean, especially in the Vajrayana, in the third turning wheel of the, of the Dharma by the Buddha, he spoke about the Buddha nature and the clear light, nature mind. And in that very important Buddha nature, we have the Buddha nature. 
And the Buddha nature is where? In the nature mind. It's like the sky. Like I once had an opportunity to go on the Concord. And when I went high and had incredible, there's not a hint of clouds, no turbulence. It's like when you go deep into the nature mind, the sky like nature. But where is the, there is all the turbulence and the clouds are on the surface. Clouds are like the lubricima, the ob, obscurations, defilements. But they are not in the nature of the sky. They're not in red and two. They're temporary, they're purifiable. Same thing as Sanjun. So, and so therefore we have the ground is yit dekin. Ground is Buddha nature. And the wonderful support is the precious human life. And wonderful circumstances meeting a, a good spiritual friend, you know. And the ways to follow the instruction. I mean, you're talking about the Lama. In the basic vehicle, you see the, uh, a teacher as an elder, a wise man. In the Mahayana, he becomes spiritual friend. He has a little, you know, he kind of takes you a bit seriously and starts correcting you because when you really love somebody, when you're truly someone's friend, you begin to show the way, you know, error of the way. In the Vajrayana, he becomes the center of your universe. We talk about that later. He becomes the whole thing. That's why tamsik, samaya, tamsik is very important. The bond, spiritual bond is really extremely important. And so, therefore, the first is human beings. We have this really yidehe himbo, you know, and, and so support the human, precious human life. One of the circumstances is having a spiritual master, qualified master, and fortunate to receive the teaching and follow instructions. Then we can purify our lubrutima and then attain enlightenment. So that being the, really the case, the first is to realize that the precious human life, you know, it's like almost saying how wonderful. One thing is that when you first wake up, how precious, you know. I always say, when I wake up, I look forward to. It's like day is like a, a new life. In fact, day and night is almost a life in itself. That's why you do practice every day, you know, practicing the do because it's like a whole life in itself, <laughs> small life. Anyway, so you wake up in the morning, you know, saying that how precious, you know, joyful to have such a human birth. Difficult find free and welfare, but because you see, when you're born with, you know, we uh, have the freedom and we are endowed with all the qualities. And we especially, you know, we have the Buddha came taught, but all those the teachings are available. Like in the, for example, in the Bhutan is blessed by Guru Mbache and some of the great masters, such as like, you know, the, you know, this um, uh, Shabdu. Now, he was an extraordinary, my God. I mean, sorry, I should not say my God. My God, that he was incredible. I mean, you know, look at his, what he did, you know, establish such strong basis of the church. That's amazing. I have so much respect for him, how he established. It's very powerful master. And so many great masters. And then more later, Long Chen Rabjam, Pema Lingpa, all these. And then, then later, Kev Dujum blessed. And then, and Kenzo Rinpoche, Chara Rinpoche, Polo Rinpoche, so many masters bless this place, you know. That is so fortunate to be born in this, you know. That's I always feel their blessings here. And so we're for fortunate, you know, that, you know, we're fortunate. So if we're very fortunate, you know, joyful to have such a human birth, but difficult to find free will. But the thing is, unfortunately, you see, uh, I, I was saying yesterday to you, uh, while I was in the conversation, uh, in that, you know, but the t trouble is, you see, we have next life, of course. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. However, now, for example, myself, I received, you know, I had a great good fortune to meet such many great masters. Never a single day I, I don't remember them mentioning their names. Lama Kadinche, really, and so that now I have a little bit, practice a little bit, I understand teaching, and I want to live long, I pray for that, because, you know, I want to accomplish in this life, ten dila. That's why to attain, you know, because we have the Dhamma Chir to attain enlightenment in this life, Bhajan. So that's why we should really realize, so precious, but you know, you should make in this one. There is life after, but then how, how you be born, 
air conditioned your room, we can pray, but how it's going to be is a little uncertain. So bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, as they say. So it's better now, strike the iron while it's hot. Catch the bull by its horn, they say. So very much the precious human life. Yes. So uh, the precious human life, uh, Dejo uh, Nika, which is the first of the Lodo Namji, yes. is basically um, being grateful and taking stock of what we already have. Have, yeah. As they say, count your blessings. Especially here in Bhutan, the viewers can, uh, there is plenty of material online and they can assess the uh, Ranjuranga, Shenjuranga, and all of that, which Rinpoche yeah, yeah. is very concisely yeah, yeah. condensing and speaking yeah. about, and especially here in Bhutan. And also, you have such, I uh, saw on your Chanchuk Singh, that Kempo, wasn't it? Kempo Sonam Boom then. I was very impressed by him. There are many wonderful ones that they should, they should teach and they should explain, you know, and there are these resources that you should make. You and all you should, you know, request that. Hmm? Precious human life. I feel that is something, a message, even for the youth, la, irrespective of the fact whether yeah. they do the Nindu or not, that this is something that they need to contemplate. Yeah. I think something is, is, is something for life. Yeah. To really see one wonderful, because you can look at two things. You can look at negative fiber. You know the saying goes, is the cup is half empty or half full? Yes. Yeah, that way. If you really look into you count your blessings, you know, you count your blessings. So many wonderful things. I mean, just the environment. I love the river here. I went, I used to go, I go down to the Thermalinka. I love that, go by the river. And the other day, I had some, like, you know, uh, some students were going through difficulty and I, I was talking to them. I was a little bit preoccupied, but then I sat near the water and I looked at the water and just realized this. Actually, whenever you go through suffering, difficulties, it's just the mind. Just to transform the mind, as the same teaching goes, Chumanyuk Natang Semachin. Water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. Mind left unaltered will find true peace. I can talk about more later. Yeah. And I remained there, immediately I found peace. Immediately. We can capture the peace now, here. And that Buddha nature is in the nature of mind. As the first human Dokkim Master Garab Doji said, mind is, and mind is and has always been the Buddha. As I mentioned to you yesterday, one great master said when he was young, he used to think Buddha was a statue. Because when you're young and you go, there's a big image of Buddha. But when he came older, he realized he was this great master who attained enlightenment, showed the way to enlightenment, you know. But now you realize Buddha is one's mind. Yeah? This is one's mind. It's here. Actually, all the Buddhas are in the ultimate nature mind. In fact, in the ultimate refuge, you know, when you remain in the nature of your mind and then open the spaciousness, the limitless, beyond all concepts the dimension of spaciousness, which we call Tongba Ni. The Ngo Tongba is Chuku, is, is the Sangye Buddha. And all the, the, uh, the Rangin Sawa is actually Dhamma, Chu. And actually, and then unity of two is the Gendu. So you can actually relate the, the refuge to the nature of your mind also. So anyway, so it's really all is available, all is available really. It's every, I just sometimes find myself also that, you know, we don't, uh, we don't actually use what we have. We have, like, for example, this prayer. You know, it's the prayer made by all the great masters of the past. And it's so wonderful. You know, it's so, I sometimes one day I realized when I said that, we don't need more than that, you know. Glorious Tawa Lama. Because Tawa Lama actually, you know who, is the embodiment of all the Buddhas. For me, it's Guru Mbache. Guru Mbache is who, in the teaching, in the long teaching, who says, Jitsun Guru Rinpoche Chen Sanje Thamche Tuji Chena Dubepa. Then I realize, ah, that's Guru Mbache. Guru Mbache is the embodiment of compassion, of blessing of all the Buddhas. For this time, Tungi Nyingma. And for me, Dujur Mbache is the Guru Mbache. Kansas Rinpoche is Guru Mbache. Jamin Shuru Guru Mbache. And Guru Mbache. 
And so, you know, he is the embodiment of all compassion, blessing Buddha, you know. And glorious Dalai Lama, precious one, dwell on the lotus seat in the center of my heart. Please remain my heart, be one with me. Bless my heart, my glorious Dalai Lama, but the Dalai Lama Rinpoche, but dwell with Lord And grant, but the Dr. Hinkar Pembe Dei, remain the heart, and Dr. Hinkar Pembe Dei, cut in chimbi gunde, you know, with all kindness, look up in the grace, Compassion and tell them, Dog, you can't be cutting chimp because you couldn't touch it. Grant me the blessing, body speech. I mean, what more you did? Lama, please remain in my heart, you know. Just and the one thing that's very important that you know is this is something we forget. Buddha himself said, Whoever thinks of me, I'm in front of them, granting blessings and empowerment. I don't know the exact quote, it's very more beautiful. And you see. He, Buddha doesn't lie, and his power is, is enlightenment such that whoever invokes him is there. Sometimes I know my teachings, they're there even before you, because they know your mind already. They have the wisdom that knows. They have the wisdom that knows. That's why I also say, Lama Keno, Sangin Keno, you know me. And they have also, if they have the wisdom, though, but if they have compassion, then it's useless. They have compassion and love, like a mother who has her only child. That kind of love they have for us. But then if they have no, they have their love and compassion, if they have no power, then they are useless. But they have power to liberate and help us. But then you might say, okay, Buddha's came, but we are still here. Why? Because we have lair, negative karma, destructive emotions. That's something, it's even for Buddha, it's very difficult. When Guru Mbachi was asked by the demonic forces, you know, even he was kind of slightly distracted, you know, they came and said, Guru Mbachi, who are you afraid of? He said, I'm afraid of Dikpa. Dikpa means um, negative karma of being, you know. Afraid of meaning that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a kind of... Uh, uh, afraid of that, uh, but then they thought it was scorpion, so they came in a huge scorpion and came to devour Guru Mbachi, whereupon Guru Mbachi manifests as Dorji Trolla or Guru Thakpur and take the scorpion uh, as subjugated and became a protection against negativity. So, therefore, Dikpa, you know, once you have obscured Dikpa, and then Buddha's difficult to help because, you know, and so, but then, if the Buddhas cannot help, then uh, what's the use? You must say, no. But that's why we practice. That's why we have to do dibjan, dibajan, remove obscurations and negative karma. That's why Ngundu. We have the Buddha nature, but we're obscured. And we have, in Dzogchen teaching, he said, we're already Ngo Yadak Sanji. We're already Pramojili, pure Buddhas already, but yet need to be obscured by adventure days on the path. Yil in the ground we are, but that's why on the part we need to purify so that we may yet again purify the two, you know, the, all the adventure stains. And so, therefore, very much, you know, we need to purify. That's why, that's why we practice. So more we practice, as in Christian saying goes, God helps those who help themselves, is that more and we practice then, you know, obscure. Like for example, when practicing to do thumb. And they call out like Guru Mitchmanan Guru Mamman or you Kedor Hevajra. More and more you call out. Especially sometimes when you do thumb. More and more you call out. And when the ops can dissolve, they can first appear maybe in a dream or little feelings or presence. Then afterwards they can come in visions. You can see them. Why the visions, you know, Shalzik? It's because obscurity is to them. They're always there. Yeah, but it's, that's why I always trust that, that, that. As Guru Mbach said, that whoever's devotion, I am by your uh, threshold, you know? And Guru Mbach also said, Nantong seeing me, you see all the Buddhas. Practicing me, you all practice, for I am the embodiment of the Sugata. Remembering all these things then really inspires you, inspires faith. And all of this is possible because we have the human birth right now. We knew the human birth. We have the human birth, and we have. And the wonderful thing is, we met the Dharma. Yes. And I you just said that those who, 
really met the Dhamma like is like the stars in the daylight. It's very rare also. We're very fortunate. We're not just like being, you know, kind of condescending. We are the like the good ones, like the Pharisees in the Bible, you know, not like that, but condescending. But no, we're the fortunate. We should be humble. And we need to really dare to help all these sentient beings. They have the also Buddha nature. Inspired by compassion, seeing suffering of beings, very much realizing. And so therefore when you seek you seek not only enlightenment for yourself, but ultimately for the benefit of all beings. Yes. And so, uh, precious human life. Yes. And um, uh, Jim spoke about purifying uh, our uh, negative uh, karmic deeds. La. And uh, while Jim in uh, uh, your kindness always speaks about the Deshe Nyingbula, and uh, so many a times I've heard, got feedback that uh, People tend to just hear the part that we are all Buddhas, but it's very kind of Rinpoche that Rinpoche emphasized the point that these adventitious stains need to be purified. Then only... Then, yeah. We cannot say, we cannot say we just have the Buddha nature. That's what Milarepa did, which if you said, by the day you've been in enlightenment, then Marpa gave him a, you know, <laughs> no need, you need to purify. Wake purify, up call. Yeah. Wake up call, absolutely. So, Rimuchi, the first, uh, speaking about practice uh, and Nguyen-ro, the first is the precious human life. Yes. The second? Well, the first is precious human life. And the second is realizing, you see, that even though this, we have a precious human life, but yet, you know, everything in this life is impermanent. Yes. So, it's Chua Mitabha. Chua mitab. And impermanence pervades everywhere. Nature, impermanence is, in fact, a great teaching. That's why in the Tibetan Book of Living Dying, the Chua Mitapa section, chapter 2 and 3, I, I think it's very valuable to read. Chua Mitapa. I remember Kansas Rinpoche, I think Kansas Rinpoche had verse, remembering, remembering death persons in the practice. Because you see, you know, because I, in the practice, that, uh, the simple one I have is joyful to have such a human birth, difficult to find, free and well favored. But joyful to have, but, but death is real, comes without warning, this body will be a corpse. As Miller said, that which you call corpse, that you were so scared of, is living here with you. And Miller said also, you know, my religion is not to be ashamed of myself when I die. Uh, so that you have no apprehension, you have no regret when you die that, you know. The death is, a, in effect, a great reminder I say in the Tibetan Book of Lake, you know, even in the Christian contemplative, you know, the monks, really true practice, they always say there's a thing, memento mori. Remember dying, or rather, remember you must die. Because if you remember you must die, then you remember, remember what life is. Because death brings to you the presence of your life. Death is like a mirror in which the true meaning of life is reflected. And you realize the pressure, like, I remember like sometimes, you know, when you're in a, a plane, is going like that, and you're about to crash, and you make, you know, you make prayers, you make a bargain with God, saying, I shall not smoke, I shall not drink, I shall be good, and you know, make all these pledges, if, Lord, please let me live, <laughs> save me. And finally, when you land, you finish there, and then you look, everything so beautiful, more beautiful, everything more beautiful, you wake up. Uh, but then, of course, you forgot the promises, <laughs> and then you go back to, you, you just go back into kind of naivety, you know, we forget. So the death wakes us up, and you really, and that's why the contemplation of death is the really, that is the heart and soul of spiritual practice. For a spiritual practitioner, the remembering death is spurs you, and teaches you not to be lazy. Like, I think in the garden, there was like a little, I think a little stream or something. There was a little bridge that it needed repairing. And he used to tell them, oh, I don't know whether we live tomorrow or not. He never let them repair it because what they use, we might not, you know. Yes. And uh, Rimoche, um, I hope it's not uh, diverting from what Rimoche is already sharing, but in Rimoche's glimpse after glimpse, I use it almost like a daily manual. And there, uh, Rinpoche speaks, uh, quoting Western philosophers as well, French, uh, mostly French. And you speak about how we need to change our perception about how we view death. Yes. And uh, about how uh, 
as if like within a family we're eating dinner, suddenly the mother says, uh, I think I might die and everybody hushes up. And so is there anything that Rimuchi would like to share about? Making, make friends with that. Making friends with that. That's why I think everybody said they make, that what I've done in the, with, with, the, with the wonderful sayings and you know, great masters and songs and make death, like fear of, remove fear of death and make into death into like a friend. Because I think it's, to be scared of death is good. Because if you're not really afraid of death, I think we need to sometimes to be a little bit afraid of what people, you know. It's, it's good, but then I think it's just sometimes what happens in the modern life is death is a taboo. People don't want to look by that. And that, and when you do, then shut away, then you know, it's become very fearful. It's like something unknown, mysterious. But if you really come to discover, come to know, because it's really, you know, you can learn what that teaches us. If everything is impermanent, because most important in the life, everything is permanent. If everything is impermanent, as Milarepa said, in horror of death, I took to the mountains. And again and again meditated on the uncertainty of hour of death. But then capturing the fortress of the deathless, unending nature of mind. Now all fear of death is done and over with. Because when you begin, if everything dies, then what is true? When you contemplate, you know, then when you realize all the material things, all the phenomena, all these things are like illusory, dreamlike. They are, you know, they're impermanent, they die. But what is that does not die? Clouds die, but the sky like nature mind, you know, nature mind, what Miller ever discovered, the nature mind, the ultimate nature mind is beyond death. When Buddha at enlightenment, the most profound statement he made, substitute he said, profound peace. Free of complexity, natural simplicity, uncompounded luminosity. Uncompounded means everything in this world is compounded. Yes. All that's created, build, will, will decay. Every meeting, separation. Every birth, death. The nature of is cause of suffering. Whereas the ultimate is uncompounded. Dumachep. Mm -hmm. And those are a great luminosity, nectar like them. So therefore, very much when you discover the ultimate nature of mind, then you see ultimate nature of mind when you realize, then you find something, like for example, at the moment of death, two things die. Your body dies, but also wonderful thing the teaching show is all your, for momentarily, all the uh, negative thoughts, emotions, you know, uh, which are the basis of your samsara or of your, you know, karma. That die. All the points, everything that obscure in their nature die. Momentarily. Momentarily. When they die, when the what is revealed, is like the growth of your true nature. Like the shell is broken. And then what's revealed is the ground luminosity. Yeo hmm? sir. Ground luminosity of our nature. That's why if you introduce the nature mind by your master in your life, because the most important tradition is nature mind. Same with Nelu, in Chaja Chembo, in Zoba Chembo. That's the most important thing. And that's the most important thing. And Miller was discovering the fortress of the deathless ending. Now all fear of death is done over with, because that does not die. And ground luminous, master using then if you sustain that through your life at all times, the most important at all times, like it says, fro like, a, like a flow of river. It'd be like a river like yoga. Yes. You know, if you integrate that way, then at the moment of ground luminosity dawns, then you recognize it, and then you attain enlightenment. That's why Lama Zimina Tudam. Because Tudam is they merge their mind, uh, you know, part luminosity with mother luminosity and it's enlightenment. When lamas remain in Tulam, that the time the disciple should pray because if he completes all the work that needs to be accomplished. And that's when they pray, receive the blessing very powerfully. So that's why you see, there's something that does not die. Even myself, through the blessing of my masters, you know, when I, you know, 
when I'm inspired by that teachings and devotion when I'm inspired and I arrive at the nature of your mind. Often I remember the word of Miladepa and even myself, you know, sometimes I say, well, I think if I die in this particular, I think I'm quite okay. So I, I want to die teaching, you know, really. That's why we have to remember because you see two things about death and impermanence. Impermanence shows that everything, you see, shows that everything in this life is, is futile. It's like, it's, everything is impermanent. So therefore, you know, let go of grasping. Because you see, it's futile to grasp. What you grasp on is also not graspable. So what impermanent teach us to let go of grasping. And root cause of all suffering is zimba, desire and grasping. That's why impermanent teach us to, to let go of grasping. And death teaches us what? That we could die soon, but that tomorrow, day after tomorrow, when we die, we do not know. I always said to students, to die is quite simple. You breathe out and you can't breathe. That's it. Maybe in the middle of life, but that's it. So you should be ready. And what it teaches us, that it, you should sort out our priorities priorities and really not waste your life because we lose in the futility. You know, success, work. I mean, you know, I've seen things, I've done things. You know, you know the saying goes, I've seen things, I've been, I've been there. Done, done. done. Yeah, I have many things I have in life. It's, everything is actually futile. I don't want to say to those who are trying to be successful, you know, it's a kind of aimless solo, but no. But ultimately, when you grow older, the wisdom is that you realize everything is impermanent, you know, and that fame, all these things are really ultimately of. And so very much when you, when you realize that impermanent teaches us that, you know, the futile grasping, let go of grasping and attachment, less grasping attachment, because, you know. I remember many Tibetans when they came with refugees, yes. practitioners, and they would say, you know, Oh, I mean, they consoled themselves, just as Buddha taught us, everything is impermanent. What has happened to us is this great impermanence, really. And Buddha also, when he passed away, he actually attained the state of, of Vajra body, so he couldn't need and die, but he demonstrated that was his great teaching. For the slope and the lazy, the final teaching is about impermanence. So death, really, like for example, people, who have had near-death experience. That means people who are either an accident or during operation die. I mentioned that in chapter 20 in the Tibetan Book of Living Dying. And they had really like an out-of-body experience and see a life review. And it's incredible. When they come back, they become completely changed life because they had a new perspective, you know, really. So it's very inspiring. So therefore, the death really changes life. And for a spiritual practice, if you remember death every day. In fact, one great master always say, if you remember Lotho Nanshi, that's why at the beginning, if you do the Lotho Nanshi begin, then you really see the purpose the, of life, of practice, of meaning. It renews, strengthens, and purifies your heart and mind. And then you practice the Buddha. And really practice, you should practice Lotho Nanshi every day, many times, to really make, you know, Shripa Namda becomes a pure. So that's why the death is really a purifier, a spur us on that, you know. Yes, yes. So uh, Rinpoche shared with us, speaking about the Lodo Namjil, the first, the precious human life, yes. about not taking this form for granted. And making good use of, in the, in the, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think Shanti Deva, Jase Shivala, in the Bodhicca Avatara, he begins by saying, we have this wonderful, you know, Precious human, if you don't make use of this again, how can we possibly hope to obtain again? You know, yes. don't blow it. Yes. Basically, don't blow it. Really, yes. don't blow it. Yep. And then, uh, speaking about blowing it, the second uh, Lodo Namji about Chiyomitau. Mm, Chiyomitau. That really makes it urgent, yes. sense of urgency. Keep First is a sense of joy, yes. joy, rejoicing appreciating life, you know, really appreciating. It's very much we need to appreciate life. Yes. Count our blessings, really. 
And the second is the urgency. Yes. But not panic. panic, not panic. Yes. But you know, and as you were saying, I didn't finish answering the question. So if you really come to know, particularly if you read the chapter, to chapter two, three, like that. In fact, many of my students whose parents don't want to hear about that. But then my students, when they read some part of the Tibetan Book of Living, Dying, share with them, then slowly they begin to realize, you know, it's not something terrible. Death is a, not a defeat, but the opportunity to great transformation. Not to see the fear like, a, you know, something to dread, but to really, we have to face that. I mean, you know, you know, Regardless, I mean, we know that. Yes. Yeah, sooner or later we have to die. But because we do not know when we are going to die or how we are going to die, so we think we have unlimited lease on life. We rather forget it, it ignorance is bliss. But then, you know, people in the, in the modern world start thinking of death only when they're near death. But so, that, isn't that a bit too late? The teachings show us we should reflect on death while we're still alive, while we are more in an inspired frame of mind, while we are near the river, seeing how the transit of nature will be able to flow, you know, permanent, see the change of seasons, you know, really all this reminder, that's a lot of knowledge in every day. And wherever we may feel like a blessing, even a sunshine comes, the blessing of the Buddhas. Uh, in a hot day, a breeze comes, the blessing of the Konjusum, and all that. You know, to, to rejoice, that's the blessing. Second, you see the urgency. And in, in order to uh, appreciate what we have, as well as uh, to be mindful about the uncertainty of our uh, mortal life, I guess we need presence of mind, that which uh, Rinpoche has been, with your kindness, always pointing towards. You know, the thing is, impermanence, is very, is really to enter into, like I find impermanence is the door. When you realize, for us beginners, for example, when you realize the nature of impermanence, then you realize, with impermanence you realize how everything is actually interdependent. We are all connected, interdependent. You understand? Yes. Interdependent. And also shows us karma, leh. It's all connected. Impermanence, actually, if you really realize impermanence, is a way to realize shunyata, tongbanyi. Tongbanyi, do. Because, you know, uh, it's like in, in, when you teach about ultimate nature of your mind, the, like the shunyata, tongbanyi. There's a wonderful way to teach. The one Dupaka you master who taught me says, Ta che tantawa. Ta means permanent. Che is non existing. Tawa is free of. Whereas ultimate nature of mind is what? Ultimate nature of things is free of permanence and non existing. Free of permanence means that whatever we have, we always think, you know. Whatever we think, we always think that, you know, something when it exists, we attach permanence to that. We put our, all our attachment, grasp. But then when you realize like this cup, if I take it and throw on a hard surface, it'll break. No longer you realize it's not so permanent. It's impermanent. And then even this cup, that's why we, because it's impermanent, if it's, not permanent, if it's permanent, there will be only one cup, not many cups. <laughs> so when it breaks into, in, in a piece, if you break it further, further into atoms, atom into energy, so therefore it's emptiness. Hmm? You know, cup is empty. Yet again, is it just empty? Is it just empty? Everything is just empty? No. It is not completely empty, that's touchy, because it exists. There's cup. I can drink from it, that's cup. Therefore, touch it and travel. It's not completely non existing. Because you see, first of all, if you realize that, you know, because of in, we think everything is permanent, something exists, and we attach to it, and we consider permanence, and like, you know, almost securing that, and that brings pain, we attachment. But 
if you realize, for example, when something breaks, something either loses, then you, you break your heart, you know. But when you realize that it's impermanent, like the story of the a woman who, uh, uh, who died, who had only child died. Krishna Gotami went to Buddha saying that my only child died and so she was in a grief. And people said only can who bring it to life is the Buddha. So Buddha said, well, if you go out looking for a, a, a little bowl full of mustard seed that comes from a house that never visited death, then I can heal her. So she went around everywhere. And finally she realized that everywhere she went, there's been death. And she realized that it's not just a personal grief, that's universal. And then she went to Buddha and asked to teach and became one of his disciples. Anyway, so that, you know, you realize then, you see, when you realize that everything is impermanent, then you let go of attachment. Yeah? When you realize it's impermanent, it let go of attachment. You understand? And then, but then you say, if it's nothing, then people say, well, then, you know, we can eat, drink, maybe if there's nothing, then, you know. We can just, you know, no, it's not like that. There's legend there. Things are tempted. There's good, bad on the relative level, ultimately not on the relative level. That's why we have to be responsible, both karmically, personally, and universally. We have to be responsible. So hence the karma. Impermanence karma and tempted all together, which leading to the ultimate nature, mind, or the shunyata. So I find impermanence very rich, really, really. So teach impermanence slowly way for people to realize impermanence, slowly open the, open the limitation of the mind, the vision, and come to realize the limitless nature of, of ultimate nature. Rinpoche, uh, uh, with Rinpoche's kindness, Rinpoche keeps speaking about the nature of mind, which quintessentially is where uh, the Dharma is uh, aimed towards. Yes. I would again like to uh, Esther Rinpoche and ask about the third Lodonamji. Third, lo third Lodonamji is very much about, there are two ways, some third as seen as the Koa Dunga, yes. and seen fourth as legendary. Yes. But actually some see it like, you know, the different traditions but even in the Nyingma also, some masters would be, you know, the, the uh, Legende and Koenyimi are seen, you know. So I begin with Legende first. Mm. Or rather, um, yeah, Legende. You see, Legende, Le Karma. Karma means actually action. Le. But action, potent with result pregnant. So when you, whatever you do, it's not just, you know, empty. Particularly the mind, the motivation is that which, you know, it says, it's not the size of the act, but the motivation that counts. Now coming to uh, karma. Uh, Lodo Namshi, the Lodo Namshi. Actually, Lodok Namshi, Lodok, Lodok is to, it's called turn your mind away from the samsara. Yes. Toward the Dharma, toward the truth. Or basically saying, all the time we've been thinking in the wrong way anyway, looking in a completely wrong perspective. It's like to, to just like almost a transformation, a, a new perspective, a change of like a true, you know, yes. vision. Like Lodok, trans, you know, you understand? And that's why sometimes it's called also four thoughts also. In the West, like four thoughts, always like this four thoughts, turn your mind away from Koa, Samsara, and toward the Dharma, the truth.